folks who have registered. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Jeff Martin, and I am a white male with graying brown hair, uh, unfortunately more gray than brown. Um, and I am wearing uh, glasses, and I have behind me a winter scene, uh, which I am wishing for. Um, welcome to uh, welcome to our webinar. And uh, if I can, I'm just going to go over a few um, household items. If everyone would please remember to keep your uh, mute. Make sure you're on mute. And um, if you would also, sometimes it's best. Uh, to keep um, everything going smoothly if you would turn your video off as well. Um, it helps with our bandwidth and to make sure everything runs smoothly. So thank you for doing that. Um, I'm also gonna point out too, that if you move your cursor to the uh, bottom of your screen, for those of you who haven't been doing Zoom uh, that often, uh, if you move your cursor to the bottom of the scene, you will see a chat icon Okay, and that is how um, you can use that if you want to ask questions or interact with each other. So please do use the chat room. We will be monitoring uh, that. Uh, before I introduce uh, Cassandra or have Cassandra take over, I also want to remind everyone that we are going to have another, uh, this is kind of a two part series in this. Um, and so next Thursday, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we will have the second part of uh, Doing Undoing. Um, so please, uh, if you would, register for that as well. And I think that's it for now. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Cassandra. Or Pam. Or Pam. <laughs> that's OK. <laughs> Um, so I'm Pamela Block. Uh, I'm a disability anthropologist at Western University in the anthropology department. I've been here just over a year after 17 years teaching in disability studies and uh, in the health professions in, in a U.S. university. These webinars today and next week's Doing Undoing, Disability, Ethnography, and Performance were originally planned as in-person co-sponsored sessions for the Canadian Anthropo uh, Anthropology Society and the Canadian Disability Studies Association meetings during the 2020 Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences Congress that was supposed to be at Western University last May. I was on the program committee for CASCA and had organized all these events and more. But uh, the pandemic came and the world changed, but I'm so very grateful to the American Anthropological so Association for providing a home for these wonderful sessions that allow us to use disability wisdom to continue to make and perform art and scholarship during a pandemic and broaden our definition of what constitutes ethnography. In this virtual gathering, let's first take a moment to remember that we are all of us connected through the winds and waters of our earth. Let us acknowledge indigenous elders past and present and the people who held the land of our homes and universities before the arrival of colonizers and invaders. Western University, my university is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee and the Lenni Lenape peoples. My image description is that of a 52 year old woman with glasses and wavy salt and pepper hair and a knitted shawl and um, I've got a, my shawl um, and a black shirt. I'm sitting in a dining room, um, mute slash music room slash COVID office. Um, and there is uh, various items in the room, including a piano, a guitar case, family photos, Hanukkah preparations, masks. This shawl I wanted to mention is a present from Carly Whitmore from Casca, one of the presents she sent to thank the 2020 program committee for our efforts. And the only way I can imagine the AAA topping this would be if they sent knitted items made of yarn spun by Deva Kaznets. So I'm going to introduce our two uh, presenters today. Cassandra Hartley is a, a assistant professor at the University of Toronto, where she teaches in the undergraduate department of health and society on the Scarborough campus. 
and in the Graduate Department of Anthropology. She is the director of the new Research Center for Global Disability Studies. Dr. Harpley identifies as a non-disabled ally to disability justice movements and settler of European descent, currently residing and working in Toronto, the traditional homeland of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Cass uses she slash her or they slash them pronouns. Her book, I Was Never Alone or a Porniki, is an, an ethnographic play on disability in Russia, has recently come out with the University of Toronto Press and is available on the press's website. We'll hear excerpts from the book today and Cass will circulate a discount code via chat. Um, and she's gonna do that right now, which will provide a $5 discount toward the purchase of, the, of her book. On screen today, Cass appears as a white woman with short wavy hair and brown eyes in a room with gray and brick walls and a plant in the background. Megan Moody is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, trained as a political legal anthropologist. In recent years, she has focused on the role creativity can play in ethnographic practice and her essays, stories and film reviews have appeared in venues such as the Los Angeles Review of Books and the Chicago Quarterly Review. This is her first screenplay and is, it is being created in collaboration with a group of disabled scholars and artists she founded called CRIP, Creativity Collab for Medical Justice. Her visual description, I am a white woman with dark hair and dark rimmed glasses. I have facial dystonia on the left side and an intermediate, intermittent speech impediment, including stuttering and slurring as a result. I now pass the microphone and the camera over to Cassandra. Hi everyone, um, this is wonderful. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Pam, for organizing this and to the AAA for hosting and to all of those of you who are here. It's really a gift to be together in this virtual way. Um, in this dark time of year in the midst of a pandemic. And I've been really buoyed along and uh, found a lot in the conversations that Megan and I have already begun around this work. So I'm really glad to share this conversation with all of you. So my recent book uh, that Pam just mentioned, I Was Never Alone or a Polkniki, is arranged around the script of a play. So while the book contains several other elements like an accompanying reflective essay and a description of the methodology in terms of bringing the script to the stage and developing the work, um, the play itself, as George Marcus wrote in the foreword to the book, is the thing. Uh, it's the reason for the book's existence and it's the part of the book that um, is the most substantive which is, as we know, somewhat unorthodox for an anthropology book. So the script is composed of six scenes, each of which is a portrait of a character who is based on a real person from my fieldwork with adults with mobility and speech impairments in Northwest Russia. And I conducted that fieldwork in uh, 2012 through 2014. And then I wrote the play script uh, at the same time that I was writing my dissertation at UNC Chapel Hill in 2014 to 2015. And with the help of Joseph Meagle, uh, director who's here today, I subsequently just developed the script uh, and we uh, worked on it through a series of readings and stagings, including one in Chapel Hill in 2016. And then later that same year in, at UC San Diego where I was a postdoc and we received a generous grant that allowed us to bring one of the research participants, uh, Vladimir Rudak from Russia to California to participate in the staged workshop and you'll hear a few audio clips that were the result of his residency uh, in the reading today. I also got to stage a reading uh, of the play at Yale University as part of the Soyuz Symposium in 2018 with Elise Morrison directing. And each, iter each of these iterations was a totally unique collaborative process. And in the book, I reflect on the unique vulnerability that emerges in the process of staging an ethnographic play uh, and the kinds of insights as the ethnographer that I got to receive about my field site through the process of interpreting what my interlocutors had said along with 
theatrical collaborators uh, in the rehearsal space. So following the work of performance studies scholar Disa Uni Madison, in the book I argue that um, rather than any finished product or moment in the spotlight, uh, the work that matters here is that development process. So I'll leave it here for now. Uh, if time allows later, I have a short excerpt from the book about the meaning of the work's title that I'll be glad to share with you if you're interested. Uh, but right now I really wanna share some performances of the script. So these performances will be excerpts adapted for the format and time of today's uh, setting, uh, which means that they're segments of longer scenes and they're kind of not gonna give you the full, the full uh, narrative arc of either scene or of the play as a whole, which is a 90 minute play altogether. Um, and if you're familiar with theater, theater, you'll recognize that this is a sort of virtual stage reading format. If you're less familiar, you'll notice that in this iteration, uh, the actors will be reading along from the script as they perform. And this is a nice way for us to share a semi-rehearsed performance without the longer rehearsal work that goes into a full performance. Uh, and in some ways, I actually think it's apt for today's setting uh, because our subject matter is collaborative scripts. Uh, the fact that the performances are partially read helps draw attention to the script itself that underlies the performance. Uh, and finally, I'll also point out that in this play and in the script, there's no ethnographer character. Uh, rather, the audience plays the role of the interviewer. So as in many other documentary theater works, the characters will speak directly to all of you as if you were the one conducting the interview. And I give this warning because I've learned from past experience that ethnographers need a little content warning before they accidentally find themselves in the middle of someone else's field work. Um, so that's a little joke uh, based on some field work that I, uh, some feedback that I got at the Yale performance when a room full of ethnographers were like, wow, I feel like I really was in your field work. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our actors. Um, so Meredith and Jason, maybe you could go ahead and turn on your cameras uh, for the introduction. Meredith Kimple is here today to reprise the role of Anya, uh, which she also played during the staged reading of I, I Was Never Alone at UNC Chapel Hill. Meredith is a freelance writer, a sometime actor, and 2015 graduate of UNC Chapel Hill where she studied English and drama. On screen today, Meredith appears seated in an interior space. She's a young white woman with brown hair and blue eyes who uses a power wheelchair. Uh, Jason Dorward joins us from Overland, Ohio, where he is visiting assistant professor of theater and drama at Oberlin College. Jason is a recipient of numerous awards for his scholarship and a past member of Family Theater in Denver, Colorado. Today, he will reprise the role of Rudolph, which he also played in San Diego and in New Haven. And in the Zoom video frame, Jason appears as a white man with a gray beard and blue eyes, also in a sort of home office space. So now, without further ado, uh, we will move into excerpts from I Was Never Alone. only have a few minutes and then we have to start our sound check if we don't do it properly the horns always drown out my vocals Rudolph raises his voice on the last phrase so that a man carrying a trumpet case to the stage in a small russian cafe turns and smirks at him <laughs> i've been with these guys for years uh at first it was just me and the other guitarist then we found our bassist oh he's a piece of work once we had him there was no going back. We added the horns when we did our second album and Live Journal was the third, local releases. We only play shows three, maybe four times a year, but we always get a good crowd. We're all busy. I've got my film projects. 
the other guys all work normal jobs. The trumpet player is also in the city orchestra. So it's enough that we get together and practice now and then. Usually they come to me or some of the guys come pick me up and carry me out to one of their cars. Just like everyone else in this godforsaken city, I live in one of the older buildings without, without ramps, without elevators. A couple of flights of concrete steps between me and the rest of the world. So if you want to talk about disability access, I can tell you plenty about inaccess. So you want to talk about disability access in our city. Um, you heard the case at the train station. The trains have these new accessible cars, fully renovated European style, state of the art. But do you think you can get to the platform in a wheelchair? Forget it, two flights of long steps and they have these new tickets, reduced fares with your disability status card. But in order to buy one of these tickets, you need to present your card in person to the ticket agent in the ticket hall. And where do you think they put the new ticket hall? At the end of the platform, totally inaccessible from the street. Two flights of granite steps. <laughs> so as long as you have a wheelchair that can also fly, you'll have a great experience on Russian trains. <laughs> so Svetlana and the gang, we got together and we wrote a letter to Moscow. And then we wrote an official complaint. And eventually, ba -boom, ba -boom, seven months, a year later, we finally get a response from whatever official office in the city government. Um, the train station will be made fully accessible for the disabled in the course of the next scheduled renovation. That was a year ago. So what do you think has happened since then? Nothing. The reconstruction is scheduled to take place two years from now. Therefore, until that time, everything is frozen. But actually, nothing will happen. I wouldn't even be surprised if nothing happens in two years. But at least at the train station, there are porters hanging around and people carrying suitcases. And they'll carry you up if you ask. What's worse is all of these storefronts. Do you think this naughty 22 year old at the shoe store is gonna come out and carry you up the steps? <laughs> Forget it. Half the places have no accessibility elements at all, just steps. And then the other half are building these totally useless ramps that have no relationship to reality. Why? Why are they cropping up, eh? Because well, first of all, the people who are building these ramps, they're not doing this so that, they're doing it so that the ramp existed. You know, so if someone asks them, do you have a ramp? Like if someone asks, not a person with a disability, but a person, let's say from some kind of committee or something like that, someone or other comes with a clipboard and whatever documents, and they'll put a check mark. That's it, access for the disabled is accounted for. I don't know about other countries, but in Russia, when it comes to building ramps and entranceways, they don't ask us to be consultants. No one who is a representative of organizations that work with people with mobility impairments or people who are wheelchair users themselves, they <laughs> create ramps that seem like to them, what a ramp should be, that they forget to install handrails or they make a really steep incline, like, or, or the ramp is just leaning up against a wall even. This way of doing things, it's every man for himself. And these people think that it'll never happen to them so that you're sitting in a wheelchair, that's obvious. It's how it's somehow supposed to be, but it's not something that ever could happen to me. Mnie. Never. Not to him or any of his family members. So I bring it up and people wave their hands and say, well, 
nothing is equipped around here. Take a look around. There's nothing comfortable about living in a block of Soviet concrete in the frozen north. Who cares if you're in a wheelchair or not? So the same guys who are doing all of this, building these useless ramps, they're suffering too. So if there's no way to do it cheaply, to save a little money, then it seems to them that no one's ever going to show up and demand a working ramp. The bassist and trumpet player cross each with another amp and begin setting things down around the stage, plugging in cables. They confer for a second, then look to Rudok. Hey, Rudok, what's the story with the set list? <laughs> what are you asking me now, pal? Can't you see I'm doing an interview? <laughs> we put the paper in the guitar case. Okay, look, but look, I know that this is a problem in other countries too, not just in Russia. I was in Germany when we pulled up to the bus station in the van. Uh, someone had taken the handicap, handicap space, uh, just pulled in there, a regular car with no sticker. So it's not just in Russia, but you know, that's how people are. Your average guy wants things to be convenient for himself, not for people with disabilities. And sometimes even he'll hold it against you. Ugh, come on. But if we were to trade lives and he had to live life in a wheelchair, well, then he'd see what's so good about accessibility. But no one wants to trade places, but they also don't want to do anything to make life easier for the guy in a wheelchair. No one cares about this problem, except for the few of us that have to deal with it. Unless they're helping, pitying us poor, helpless cripples. Russia. Russia! I, I can get kind of romantic about it, though. Our motherland. Have you heard our song? The one about Japan. Oh, it goes like this. We'll play it later on. Portrait 6, Anya. In this scene, Anya will be performed by Meredith, and her housemate, who also performs personal care duties, will be read by the narrator. Now into the scene. Lights come up on Anya's scene. Anya's apartment is newly renovated with textured wallpaper and a new refrigerator with a small collection of magnets. There's a kitchen table with a large bowl filled with mandarin oranges and packets of cookies. Anya comes in directing her electric wheelchair with a small joystick. She's 35 and has neatly styled bobbed hair with bangs and is wearing lightly applied feminine makeup and delicate gold jewelry. The back of her wheelchair includes a high headrest and she sometimes leans her head against it as if saving muscle strength in her neck for later. Anya turns in her chair to face the audience as if greeting a guest who has just come in. So how do you like my new apartment? Oh, feels like it's been a long time coming. This is the common room. Uh, there's no furniture yet, but I'm getting a sofa probably. And then I'll also put like a bunch of folding chairs and something like an easel with paper or a whiteboard in here. So I'll be able to host group work sessions and individual therapy here. I've got a home office. Can you believe it? Oh, so. Like I said, I've been trying for ages to figure out how to do private practice on the side. I want to do counseling for everyone, people with disabilities and also people who are just normal and group sessions too. Why should I have separate groups? Oh, moving here is good. Before in my parents' apartment, I had my own room, but I had the idea to live on my own. Like it was, it was growing growing, growing, growing inside of me for a long time. And then it sort of crashed over me like a wave. It just flooded over me in one moment. 
I was sitting in the kitchen in my parents' apartment with this one girl. Uh, she had come from Luhi in this tiny village way up north, and she lived with us for a while. Uh, but then with my nephews, it got to be too much, so she moved out. But we liked each other, and she had come to visit me. And she and I were talking. She's saying that she has to move somewhere, but she doesn't make much money, and it's scary to move to rent an apartment and everything. And I, like, I'm sitting there and saying to her, listen, like, do you think it would be possible for us to live together? And I sort of inserted my own interests because I can't live alone, you know? Well, so, and she, like, her eyes lit up. Let's do it, I'm in. So I got her out of Luhi. And she lived here while we were doing the renovation in the middle of the mess. What a disaster. Well, so, so basically I renovated these rooms little by little and then my friends decided to wallpaper for me. Oh, I knew that I had to organize a workspace around myself. I mean, at home in a living space, uh, but there at my parents with kids, it didn't work. My nephews were always coming in and out. Someone's always staying over or someone's coming to visit or my dad was roaming around. It's just that, you know, when you live with your parents, it's one thing. You think, geez, where would I go? You know, parents are parents. They meddle in everything. It has to be that way. They have to know about everything, you know, every last thing. And especially in my, in my situation, right? I mean, shit, without my mom, I can't even put my underwear on or do the things I want to do ultimately. Why did you put those ones on? Why didn't you put these ones on? Well, I don't want to wear those. I wanted these ones. So, so that's, it's good to be here. Well, and like the renovation took two months and it was, Everything was ready somewhere around the end of February and it was ready to go. I could have moved in already. Uh, but then I had these long, tortured conversations with my dad. He wouldn't talk to me for two weeks. Basically, he didn't talk to me at all. He basically didn't talk to me at all. And then shit hit the fan. I don't remember what it was about. He just started acting like a jerk, you know. Obviously, he has some kind of intense overprotectiveness. I understand that he's afraid for me. He's really afraid. So, and then he's worrying about all of it. And that he doesn't understand my mom. My mom, more or less, is the one who cares for me. It's hard for my mom. My mom said, I'm tired. Let's hope it goes well. Try it and we'll see what happens. I have to try, you understand. I won't live out my days with my parents. They're not immortal. There's no avoiding that. Well, so uh, I couldn't get past it all with him, with my dad. And so I kept my mouth shut and I left. I wrote him a letter. My dad, because, you know, it had turned into the kind of situation where as soon as I started to say something, he would just start yelling and I would start to cry. Uh, so in it, I very plainly explained in this letter, like, Papa, what did you raise me for and give me an education so that one day you could say to me that I'm too seriously ill and that I can't do anything for myself? You helped me get two, two professional degrees. So what for? So that they could hang out on the shelf? I want to do something, to change things somehow with, with my own means. And while you are opposed, while you are opposed to it, you could be helping me to stand on my own two feet. I just think about my friend her mother died uh, in two months, if you can imagine, her mom died. So she was healthy, healthy, and then bam, that's it, no mom. And the girl was like, she was in my situation, pretty much the same, you know, she's 35 also. 
And what happened? She was left with no one. She didn't have anyone at all. They were in a hurry to find someone there who would care for her and everything. Is that how things should be? I don't want that. Or worse, an institution. I want to already be somehow in some way prepared so that I have some way of being on my own and everything. So I say to my dad, Papa, look, if it doesn't work out for me, then I'll come back and live with you again. I'll live, Dad, you know. Or else I'll say, Papa, okay, it didn't work out. Yesterday, I went over for my things. And there he was, treating me like a stranger. I'm like, so this is how it's going to be? I'm like strangers? And I'm planning to go for spring holidays next weekend. And a few days ago, I went by with some friends and uh, it was a holiday. And when I came in, he was sort of drunk. He was sitting on the couch in his room. I like go over and say, Papa, while I have five days off, I wanna bring that other couch over. He's like, over where? And I say, Papa, to the apartment, of course. And I start to leave. And he's like, my dad is like, we'll bring you your fucking couch. When will you bring it? Will you bring it tomorrow? He's like, okay, tomorrow. My eyes basically fell out of my head. I was so surprised. My letter for you is lying there. He says to me, I read it. And I say, good for you. You read it. He's like, it's an inappropriate letter. And I say, why? It's a perfectly appropriate letter. Why is it an inappropriate letter? It's a perfectly appropriate letter. Larissa, Anya's housemate and helper from earlier in the scene, crosses going from the back of the apartment to the exit. When she's just off stage, she yells back, on, don't forget the laundry detergent. Okay, see you later. Bye, Paka. So anyway, the couch will go over there. Anya rolls back into the main room. She turns her chair to face the audience as if looking out a large window. I really like living on the first floor. I can see everything from the window. And I have a ramp at the front stoop. They already built it for me. I just have to get down the one set of stairs and then off I go. And I'm thinking about putting in a separate entrance right here through the balcony. You know, building a whole new entrance, a ramp with no stairs. I guess I have to write to the ministry, write to the ministry and request that they build it for me. An adapted exit an accessible exit, some kind of form or declaration, maybe an inspection. I don't know what, but why not? I may as well try, even if it takes forever. Yeah, that'll be good. Imagine, I'll be sitting here like me, but 85 years old, just like I'm sitting here now. <laughs> Fucking hell. They'll come and say, Anna Alexevna, we have built a ramp for you. Well, thank you very much. That was Jason Rudock and Meredith Kimball reading excerpts from I Was Never Alone or A Porniki. Please join me in thanking our performers for that reading and offering them a nice round of ASL applause. That was so wonderful, Jason and Meredith. I'm so grateful for all that you bring to these roles and for joining us for today's event. So I'm gonna pass this on now to Megan Moody who will share from her work. Uh, and just let you all know that we will be having a talk back session in a separate Zoom room after this event, uh, which I'll share in the uh, chat now. 
Hello, I'm Megan Moody from UC Santa Cruz, um, and I live and work on the traditional unceded lands of the U Uyupi tribe of the Awawas Nation, today represented by the Amamutsun Tribal Band, who are descendants of the people taken into missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista. First off, I want to thank um, Pamela Block um, and the other panelists both today and next week for the privilege of participating in this event. I'm especially grateful to uh, Cassandra whose conversation and encouragement have already played a very formative role in this new project. I also want to thank the uh, American Anthropological Association for marking the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which is, was this year. Um, and uh, I think because, oddly, because of the pandemic has perhaps not received the conversation um, that it should. Um, my most heartfelt thanks go to Cynthia Krupp, who directed the scenes that I'll be sharing today and who took a huge leap of faith in taking on this project. Um, and I still can't believe that I got to work with such a, um, with a, with a team of immensely talented actors that um, bring this script to life. So I want to thank um, Birgit Hapak, uh, Toma Brasovanu, Catalina Florescu, uh, Marina Selinder, and Ken Bolden. Um, we very much hope that you'll join us for discussion. Uh, the link will be in the chat. Um, come join our Zoom room conversation and after party. Um, and I'm happy to talk about this project more at length, but the very briefest introduction that I will, um, that I'll say is that these are scenes from a feature length screenplay in progress that is part autobiography, part ethnography and part narrative fiction. The script uh, and pieces of the recording that we created today uh, will go on and be used in collaborative focus groups with other disabled women across the country whose input will become an important contribution to the ongoing writing process. So I am the script writer on the project and it certainly draws uh, from my own life, but the hope is that this story is not singular, but rather brings to light the struggles and the humor and the rich complicated relationships of millions of women who live with undiagnosed or difficult to diagnose chronic illness and pain. Um, my email will also be in the chat if you can't join us afterwards and you'd like to ask any questions or make any comments. And with that, I will try this very complicated screen sharing thing. Hi everyone. I guess I'm just gonna um, call us back together to just share a moment if you wanna even turn on your camera so we can just all say hi. <laughs> um, and I would love to um, invite you to check out the link for our Zoom discussion. Um, that Cassandra has very graciously offered to host via uh, the University of Toronto. Um, and we will take um, questions and um, comments and just uh, have a discussion. Um, I'm putting also my email again in the chat. If you can't make the after discussion and you have any feedback, I would love to hear it. Um, and I'm going to turn it back, I think, to Pam to, to wrap us up. I think you actually did an excellent job. I, I don't have any more to add. Thank you all for coming. It was great to, to, um, to, to have such a wonderful large community of participants. And I hope to see some of you in um, Cassandra's uh, uh, Zoom space soon. Also, I guess for those of you who are still here, remember next Thursday, uh, the second part of Doing Undoing. We'll see you then. Thanks, all. <laughs>